Welcome, everyone. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, we're delighted to come to meet a very special person today. Before I introduce Abby Kelly Foster, I'd like to just remind people that the 1860 Meeting House is very pleased to be working with Martha Herbig and the Granger House. And this house was built the very same year that the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House was built. And if you're driven by that, you know it's two extremely different buildings, so it's going to be very interesting to see a kind of ways that we can relate to each other. So thank you, Martha. Um, the Meeting House, as many of you know, just received almost half a million dollars from the, New York, or the Federal Historic Preservation Fund for a historic site relating to equal rights to help restore that building. So we really expect to be moving forward quickly. And, uh, well, we're working with the architects now. We'll probably start construction in the spring. So we're really happy about that, very pleased. Um, one of the people that we're going to meet today is Lynn McKenney Leidick from Worcester, Massachusetts. She is a public historian, an educator, an actor. And she's traveled throughout New England, New York, Illinois, Ohio, and she brings to life historically significant women. She spoke last night in Seneca Falls at the Wesleyan Chapel, where Abby Kelly Foster once had spoken. And she provides a framework within which we can begin to see and understand not just the past, but also the present and the future that we all live in by looking at the lives and the work of these remarkable <coughs> women. Yours for Humanity, Abby, is about the 19th century radical abolitionist, Abby Kelly Foster, who is um, um, very, who, who came through this area and was very active in really radicalizing at a grassroots level a lot of people in central and western New York. Lynn is honored and humbled to speak Abby's words and to keep her spirit alive. Abby's message of equality and justice for all human beings is needed as much today as it was in the 19th century, if not more, and her words are a call for courageous action. Um, Abby Kelly Foster um, came to Central and Western New York in 1842, 1843, and 1851. And everywhere she went, she challenged Americans to end slavery, end racial prejudice, and recognize the rights of women. She attacked churches as pro-slavery institutions, so no churches would let her speak there. So she had to come to courthouses or schoolhouses or parlors, and that's very appropriate that we're here right now. In Senate Falls, she had to speak outdoors in an apple orchard. Um, she often spoke at meetings with black male abolitionists like Frederick Douglass or Charles Lennox Ramon, and you can imagine the impact that might have had both in bringing audiences to see such an unusual duo speaking, but also in developing criticism and to, and to ask why. Why does she do this? What does this have to say about her message? She also helped women locally in 1843 form the first women's anti-slavery fair, which made the biggest fundraisers for abolitionism and also became a major catalyst for the women's rights movement. So people, women involved in those fairs ended up involved in the Senate of Falls Women's Rights Convention as well. Abby Kelly's audiences were never neutral audiences. Um, one newspaper said that her talk was absurd, visionary, and impractical. But others thought she was a noble and gifted woman. From every place she lectured, said one of them, the most thrilling reports of her effective labors are received. No public speaker we have ever heard could have held his audience in fixed attention to an equal degree of absorption. Today, as we move back in time, we go to 1854 in northeastern Indiana, and you will have a chance to hear Abby speak and to decide what you think about her words. We join Abby Kelly Foster as she lectures to the people of the town and to the female anti-slavery sewing circle. Those are the roles that we get to play in this drama. And as she writes letters to her family, let us join Abby Kelly Foster at the end of one of her passionate speeches. I feel the 
agony of the poor slave mother as she wails with broken hearted grief. Her young child is ripped from her arms as the mother is sold to another master on a plantation far away. Oh, pity the poor slave, treated worse than a beast, forced to carry a hundred pounds of cotton on her back, beaten raw by the master's whip. And even little children do back-breaking work. They hoe and pick cotton from sunup to sundown. Why? Because they are the property of someone else, simply for the crime of having a dark complexion. On the auction block, a young husband and wife, aged 18 and 17, sell for $2,000. A 12-year-old boy sells for $645. A 14-year-old girl fetches $865 for her master, but if she's light-skinned, she fetches a little more. And a crying toddler, standing all alone on the auction block, is sold to the highest bidder. One-sixth of our nation's population is in chains. Why slave hunters wander these very woods to kidnap brave Negro men and women? Well, they capture not only the fugitive, but the freeborn black to send them back into bondage. Slavery. Slavery has been victorious since that atrocious fugitive slave law was passed. The heavens have been overcast with dark clouds overshadowing this nation with gloom and despair. Oh, honest-hearted citizens like you and you must not allow this tragedy to continue. Stop the prejudice against color that allows such an evil system to exist. A slavery is a crime and a sin, and it must be ended immediately. Each new audience listens carefully when I first describe the cruel, hard facts of slavery. The slave families are ripped apart forever. Though nothing like their anguish, my heart hurts each time I leave my dear husband Stephen and our darling daughter Alla with her big brown eyes and chestnut hair. Well, I don't know how I could go on if I was never allowed to see her again. I can't believe how well she prints now. My dear mother, I sure would like to see you. Oh, I wish you were here and not so far away in Indiana. I was sick yesterday forenoon, but I'm well now. I have made me a new apron, and I'm making me a pair of new underdrawers. Father and I have begun to drop potatoes. I drop them in the holes, and Father, he covers them with the dirt. And he says, if I sell them all, if I drop them all, he will sell them for me and give me all the money he gets for them. Mother. You know how my bedtime prayers always end with amen? Ought we not to say a woman sometimes? <laughs> when are you coming home, mother? Write to me soon. Your affectionate daughter, Allah. Oh, I'm missing out on so much of Allah's life. But I am pleased that Stephen is teaching her to earn and control her own money. Why, how can the law allow a father or a husband or even an older brother to take all of a girl a woman's earnings? Shameful. Oh, my darling Allah, your birthday is coming soon. And then you shall be seven years old. What a great girl you're getting to be. 
You will soon be as tall as I am, I think. I had planned on coming home to keep house with you, but I've decided to stay here a bit longer. I have to make these men realize that slavery is an evil and that slave mothers must be with their children. Do you often think of the little slave girls who can never see their dear mothers again? I pity them more than I pity us, for I am quite sure I shall be with ho we home within six weeks, and then we shall have fine times together. Can it really be a half year since I saw my darling daughter? That is the sacrifice that God has asked of me. Now, the first three years I lectured, I was on my own, and it really wasn't so bad. Then, Stephen and I fell in love. For the next four years, we stole our moments together whenever our paths crossed at some anti-slavery convention, or when, when we were lucky. We were scheduled to lecture together for several weeks at a time. Of course, we never let on that we had feelings for each other until after we were married. And then Allah was born. Oh, it broke my heart to leave her with Stephen and his family, but how could I selfishly stay at home with my darling daughter while so many poor slave mothers had their young babes torn from their arms? These past few months, Stephen and I have lectured together all across Michigan and Ohio. It was like the honeymoon we never had. <laughs> but Stephen admits that I am the better lecturer and he's the better farmer. So he hurried home three weeks ago for spring planting in Massachusetts. Oh, how I often think of that large old farmhouse in Worcester with the fruit trees and the fresh vegetables, the strawberries. And at night, our abolitionist friends gathered around our fireplace and my darling daughter sitting on my lap. Alla, you cannot imagine this poor log home in which I am staying. I share the one sleeping chamber with my hosts, Sarah and her husband, William, while their three children sleep in the loft above, and their every movement causes dirt to fall from the rafters. <laughs> oh, but they're good Quakers and fine abolitionists, but they, like many others here, are too timid to do anything truly active for the cause. Oh, 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 the fleas. Oh, 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 the fleas. Oh, Allah, the one thing I don't like here are the fleas. Oh, since the weather's grown warmer, they're having such a feast on my body, I'm afraid I'm growing quite thin. Oh, what I need to soothe all of these bites is a cold water dunking from head to toe. My little hand basin's not enough. A daily cold water bath is essential to our physical and spiritual well-being, and the colder, the better. I'm sending you a book to help you remember the little slave girls Keep on being a good helper. Your affectionate mother. Well, I must not complain about dirt and fleas. The work I do for the anti-slavery movement is far more important. You see, I work hard to plant these seeds, but first I must dig out the roots, the roots of prejudice, and plant these seeds like a garden and water them with a passion for justice. When I do that and the little seedlings bloom, I'm as happy as farmers are in the fields when everything blooms up nicely. 
but there are other fields to which I must attend. And I cannot leave this place without someone to weed this garden of all the ignorance and to water it with a passion for justice. Now that means I must find someone to become corresponding secretary for their new local anti-slavery society. And someone, someone must sell newspaper subscriptions to the anti-slavery bugle and the liberator, or the people here in northeastern Indiana will not know what's happening all across the nation. Oh, I will. I will find someone to take over here, for this work must continue. I owe it to the broken-hearted slave mothers of the South. Right here, brothers and sisters, in this very township, three white men sit in jail for helping a runaway Negro slave. You know who they are. They're your three good neighbors. Well, I can tell by this rock thrown through that window that not all people in your community agree with my anti-slavery sentiments. What's that you say, sir? You think I ought to be locked up in jail? Well, that man has a point. You see, according to the Fugitive Slave Law, I, Abby Kelly Foster, am a criminal. Yes, yes, I have willingly broken the law, and I shall do so again and again as long as the laws and constitution of this nation support the evil system of slavery. Now, do you realize that those three men sitting in jail can be kept there up to six months and fined a thousand dollars each? Well, what if you had given a fugitive shelter? What if you had given one a cup of water? Before the eyes of this great nation, you both are criminals. But before the eyes of God, no person is a criminal for upholding the natural laws of the universe. Each of us, man and woman, white and black, is created equal and deserves to be free. I know. I know some people scoff and scowl at the idea of equality. Some even throw rocks. But we abolitionists hold this truth to be self-evident. When the church-going people of this nation do nothing to put a stop to slavery, they might just as well be supporting it. Oh, shh, shh, hear me. Hear me, brothers and sisters, shh, hear me. There can be no bargaining with the slaveholders. There can be no union with the slaveholders. And that includes the churches and the political parties in Congress that compromise with the slave system. I, I am bound by my duty to God to speak this truth. The United States Constitution is a slave document, and it was written by slave owners. Three hours, three hours, and such an unruly crowd. I wish I'd had someone with me to share the stage. Let's see, I was called a traitor, an infidel, a man-woman, a Jezebel. <laughs> Would they have been more original? I was called all that 15 years ago in Connecticut. <laughs> oh, the people here in northeastern Indiana don't want trouble. But I am here to plant trouble. Dear Stephen, oh, how I miss traveling beside you. There is no one here with whom I can speak freely. We have established a female anti-slavery sewing circle to help raise funds for the cause, but many women are getting nervous. One said, A sister sends this here bonnet. Uh, she promises to keep it sewing at home for the poor slave. Uh, she's too afraid to come to your meetings and your lectures. She knows her husband would never permit it. Poor sister, she works hard to break the slave free of his chains. 
but she's unaware of the shackles that bind her like a slave to her husband. And then the Methodist minister, who had been so eager to let me use his church meeting house, cornered me. <clears throat> now, Mrs. Foster, you know I'm no lover of the slaveholder, but all that yelling and rock throwing and violent, why that's too chaotic for the house of God. I'm afraid you're going to have to find yourself another place to lecture from now on another lukewarm supporter of abolition. Why, even the school teacher refused to let me use the schoolhouse. She was afraid some parents might object. Well, I have lectured in fields and apple orchards before. There's an empty lot next to the blacksmith shop in town. I shall lecture there if I have to. Oh, Stephen. What can I do to help these people find more courage? The sewing circle meets tomorrow. What can I say to make them less afraid? Ladies, ladies. Don't feel bad that there are so few of us here today. <laughs> Many were frightened by the disruptions at my meeting last night. But whether we are many or few, stitch by little stitch, we are helping free humans from bondage. Oh, and the sale of your neck scarves and children's aprons and quilts will bring good money at your anti-slavery fair. My first abolitionist meeting. Well, I attended my first abolition meeting when I was 21 years old. It was held in Worcester, Massachusetts, and William Lloyd Garrison spoke. <coughs> we must raise up the standard of emancipation till every chain be broken and every bondsman set free. Let all the enemies of the persecuted blacks tremble. Well, I myself trembled, but I could think of no way to help the cause until a few years later. I took a teaching post in Lynn, Massachusetts. I joined the Female Anti-Slavery Society there, and I was elected corresponding secretary. Oh, I had not anticipated how strongly people would oppose our abolitionist message, particularly when delivered by a woman. Oh, you want to know about my first speech? Well, I gave my first speech in 1838. It was in front of a promiscuous audience. That's men and women together in the same room. It was at Pennsylvania Hall in Philadelphia. Oh, the reformers had built that brand new building so we wouldn't have to go begging for a place to meet. Oh, at the end of that inaugural weekend, white women and black women, oh, we felt strong in each other's company. Why, when we left the building, we had to link arm and arm to force our way through a mob of 3,000 angry men and boys. Why, this was just 40 miles from the slaveholding South. But we walked about a block. We could smell the smoke. We could even feel the heat. Our brand new building was a roaring inferno. Oh, now you might ask if the firefighters came. In fact, the mayor and the fire chief were already there. I don't see a fire, do you? I don't see a fire if you don't see a fire. And as they turned their backs, Pennsylvania Hall burned to the ground. But there was one good thing that came out of that weekend. After hearing me speak, one of the movement's greatest speakers, Mr. Theodore Weld, asked me to become a lecturer for the American Anti-Slavery Society. 
I didn't think I was capable, but he said to me, Abby, if you don't, God will smite you. Well, I didn't want him to smite me, so here I am. Oh yes, oh yes, I was afraid. You see, I, I had not the name to call upon. I had not the gift of public speaking, nor money in my purse. And even my family thought me under a delusion to think that a young woman could travel around the country alone and give speeches. But God kept calling me to do this work. So I quit teaching. And with his help and a little help from my friends, I learned how to do what was asked of me. Ladies. Ladies, I do, I do understand your fears. It is not easy to be a woman and break free of our chains. But I rise because I am not a slave. There's no shame in being afraid. There's only shame in letting that fear overpower your duty to humanity. Why, the bravest people are those people who are afraid, but still have the courage to do the right thing. And you, sisters, you are brave for coming here today. As we left the sewing circle, storm clouds were gathering. <laughs> Stephen. A terrible thunderstorm blew into the region about noon. Before we could get safely home to Sarah and William's home, our buggy got stuck in the middle of a huge puddle. Well, as we all got out to walk, down I went splat. <laughs> Would you please tell Allah that I finally received that cold water dunking I had so longed for? <laughs> oh, but the storm caused more of a mess than mud on my petticoats. William reported there's a half foot of mud in the empty lot next to the blacksmith shop, so I cannot lecture there. Well, I just about threw my arms up in despair, but William counseled me. Now, Abby, you know God always finds a way. I know. You may use our barn. I'll go out, I'll find the boys, and we'll clean it up. Well, right then, Sarah pulled me aside. She looked distraught. A fugitive slave named Jacob had been hiding out in town in the blacksmith shop. The slave hunters had found out he was there, so Sarah let the blacksmith bring Jacob to her barn just this morning. Oh, Abby, Abby, what have I done? What have I done, Abby? William has no idea there's a fugitive slave hiding out in the barn. Oh, Abby, what have I done? Oh, he ain't going to break any laws, Abby. Even ungodly laws like the fugitive slave law and the Indiana black laws. What have I done? What have I done, Abby? I have disobeyed my husband. What kind of a wife am I? But just then, William stormed in. Those scoundrels! Pardon my vulgarities, ladies. Our neighbors have just been found guilty of stealing slaves from their proper owners. Oh, that dang fugitive slave law. Abby, Abby, you are right. We must disobey these evil laws in every way we can. <laughs> well, Sarah thought she would test William's newfound resolve. She told them about Jacob hiding out in the barn. The look on William's face was unforgettable. But before the day was out, William and the boys had built Jacob a small hideout in the barn loft. Now, who will ever suspect that while I am giving an anti-slavery speech below, there'll be a fugitive slave hiding a barn? <laughs> and who knows, others like William may join our cause. Welcome, dear friends, on this muddy night. When Indiana Territory was first opened for settlement three generations ago, everyone was welcome and nobody was forbidden. 
But now, the so-called black laws in Indiana's new state constitution forbid any Negro or mulatto from settling in this state. Why, even the early freed black settlers are now being punished. Their contracts are no longer honored. They cannot serve on juries, and they cannot vote. I ask you fine people, is this not prejudice against humanity? How can anyone allow one race to control another? Well, I'm sure by now you all have heard that your three neighbors have been found guilty. I pray that that verdict will have erased any doubts that remain in your heads and your hearts. For it is time, Northeastern Indiana, it is time that you be heard. You can sign this petition. Sign this petition and ask your legislators to repeal these atrocious laws. Ladies, ladies, wait, don't, don't shy away, ladies. It is true that like the slave, you cannot control your own employment, you cannot serve on juries, and you cannot vote. But you can sign this petition. The First Amendment of the Constitution gives you that right. I urge you all, claim this small voice in our democracy and sign this petition. Sign it and remove the ugly blot of slavery on your land and preserve liberty and justice for all. Brothers and sisters, there are men at the back of the barn carrying rifles. Turn, turn and see for yourself the face of the slave hunter. You are not welcome here. You shoot me if you will, but you will not stop my voice. Before the eyes of God, all human beings are free. At first, nobody moved. And then William was by my side, and then another, and another, and even a young girl. But one of the slave hunters raised his rifle. But Sarah, Sarah started us chanting, no slave hunters welcome, no slave hunters welcome. And the minister and the school teacher joined us in our chant, no slave hunters welcome. The slave hunter lowered his gun. They all backed out of the barn and they were gone. And I continued to lecture to a barn full of newly converted abolitionists. <laughs> Stephen, Stephen, tonight I saw people change right before my very eyes. They peacefully broke the law to stop the slave hunters. When good-hearted people are forced to choose between good and evil, they will choose the true course. I shall be home in a fortnight. This has made all my tears and loneliness worthwhile. Sarah has agreed to become corresponding secretary for their new anti-slavery society. And William, William promises to sell newspaper subscriptions to the anti-slavery bugle. Oh, my little blossoms and seedlings are turning into full blooms of anti-slavery grace. <laughs> but the prejudice, the prejudice still remains in the hearts of so many. Nothing, nothing can be considered done while anything remains undone. Oh, the people of this place, oh, they will carry on when I am gone. You see, it's so important that everyone does something to aid the cause of humanity and justice. You don't have to go around giving speeches, but you 
to have to give a little something, a little time, a little money, a little honest effort. For you see, if things are going to change, it is up to you people here. I am forever affectionately yours for humanity, Abby. everybody. Thank you for coming here. Thank you to the Granger Homestead for hosting and thank you to the Quaker Farmington 18, 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House uh, for having Abby come back along this way. <laughs> um, I'd be happy to answer any questions you have about Abby or about the movement or Women's rights, I have some experts here that can help me on all fronts. Yes? What became of her daughter? Oh, that's a good question. What became of Allah? Well, Allah became a school teacher. First off, Quaker women, uh, Quaker families believed in educating their daughters. Other um, churches and faiths did not. But the Quakers believed that women and girls should have the same education as boys. Um, so Abby went to the Moses Brown School in um, Providence, Rhode Island, and um, it was a Quaker school. And when Alla was of an age to go to school, um, Abby and Stephen had enough money or told Alla that they would have enough money for her to <coughs> attend four years. So she went to Vassar College. And after she graduated from Vassar College, she went a year at Cornell and then came back east and worked with a friend on home hygiene, uh, you know, ensuring that you um, don't have dirt cellars and all that, the toxic fumes and, and all of that. She did that at MIT with a friend of hers for about a year. And then she became a teacher. Uh, she writes this really poignant letter to Abby and Stephen congratulating them on, uh, you know, as they're getting older, sti to still having been involved in the reform movements as much as their health allowed them to. And she said that, you know, we're lucky that I am not worse because usually children of famous people never do anything with their lives. It's kind of sad that she said that, but she was a teacher. So just as Abby changed people's hearts and minds by traveling around and lecturing and starting um, local groups and networks of people that uh, could gather and discuss. Alla became a teacher. She taught um, in New England, in the Boston, Roxbury area, but when she found out that female teachers were paid less, okay, still are probably, um, in New England she moved to the Midwest to teach because they were paying equal wages um, to men and women. Uh, then when her, her folks' health started to fall, uh, to fail, she came back east to be, to be closer to them. But she didn't, never married, didn't have children. Um, she bought a piece of property up in um, New Hampshire. Uh, it was a big, beautiful, old uh, building and had girls from the school come up in the summertime and teach them a trade. Um, you know, working in the hotel, it was a, like a B and B. They had guests, and so they waited tables and they did laundry and all of that. So um, she did that over the summers for the for the uh, girls. Yes. Um, who were her contemporaries? Uh, if, you, if you could review, like, the yeah. year that this was sort of based and happening. Yes. And then, mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. Um, put Abby in context and in this time frame of of other people. So. Abby heard William Lloyd Garrison speak when she was 21 years old. Uh, she then really knew that was her calling. She gave her first speech in 1838. At that point, um, there were no other women lecturers at the time. The Grimkeys had stepped away from lecturing. The, the sisters that came from South Carolina um, became Quakers when they came up here. They lived on a plantation. Uh, they knew the evils of slavery. Um, and Angelina had, had lectured, and usually in smaller crowds and parlors and things. Um, 
but when she stopped lecturing, uh, Abby really started um, lecturing, and there were um, male counterparts lecturing, but Abby was really one of the, the female lecturers that started the earliest and lasted the longest. Um, so she was responsible really for Susan B. Anthony starting to speak on abolition, as most women's rights uh, people started in abolition and then veered off and went to women's rights. But as Abby was standing up and speaking in front of people when it was not a correct thing to do, she was really at the forefront of the women's rights movement. Um, so there was Susan B. Anthony, uh, Lucy Stone. Lucy Stone was going to Oberlin College and um, Lucy invited Stephen and Abby. Uh, Stephen was a radical abolitionist as well, radical Garrisonian abolitionist who ble believed in equality, not just to end slavery. There were lots of abolitionists that thought slavery was a bad thing, but they didn't want equality. Uh, so the Garrisonians were very much radical. Um, and so the two of them um, decided that they were going to lecture together, which they did, and for four years they didn't um, show that they had affection for each other because back then if you got married, and actually there were articles in newspapers that said, well, we hear that Abby Kelly is going to get married. Well, perhaps now she'll stay home and darn socks. So, I mean, it, it, they called Stephen Mr. Kelly. Um, you know, who wears the trousers in the family? The, I mean, the whole, all of the stuff they say now about women, they said it back then, 1841, 1842. Um, so Lucy Stone invited Stephen and Abby to Oberlin. That did not go over well with the... Um, <laughs> the head leaders of the school, um, but Abby wanted Lucy to lecture, but Lucy ended up taking seven years to get her um, degree because you only had so much money, then you had to stop and teach and make more money and go back because Lucy Stone's dad did not believe in educating daughters. Uh, and so the money went to educate the boys in the family. So she did, when she was done, she started lecturing um, she also lectured on women's rights and she would do abolition during the week and women's rights on the weekend. Um, but Abby stuck with abolition wholeheartedly, but again, by being out there when they weren't, for five years she traveled on her own. No, no one, people would say they'd go with her, like the McClintocks and Margaret Pryor, and they did after a while, but for five years, no one else traveled with her. Um, so all sorts of things were said about her in the newspapers and um, ministers, as Judy said, did not allow her to come into the church, her, her um, odious character um, and all that. Um, so she was very much, she was in Seneca Falls in 1843, five years before the first Women's Rights Convention in 1848. And she was there lecturing in orchards and she was, uh, really was the spark that got people in Seneca Falls to start to think about women's rights and slave rights. So not only rights for the enslaved, but rights for, for women. Not both of them being controlled by other people. So, um, so she, the networks were amazing. You know, had the temperance workers and the Graham Diet people and the, uh, um, homeopathy and hydropathy and um, phrenology, abolition, women's rights, all of those people knew each other. The networks were phenomenal throughout the Northeast. Um, as a matter of fact, New York, oh, and I have this book, um, two books here actually. Um, so this is Judy Wellman's book, The Road to Seneca Falls, which does credit Abby with speaking the five years before the Women's Rights Convention. Um, and this book, ahead of her time, this is um, Abby Kelly and the Politics of Anti-Slavery. And in here, this is really the only full book written about Abby. Th there is um, an, another book, Margaret Hope Bacon, but it's a, it's a smaller um, book, but has some great quotes and, and passages from letters. But this book taught, has one whole chapter about the psychic highway. That's what they call the road through New York, the psychic mm -hmm. highway. And Abby lectured throughout New York in 1842 and 43 a little bit in 41, 42, and 43, just all over. And when she'd go to a certain town, she'd stay there five days. She was sort of her own advanced person. She'd get there, she'd find a place that would allow her to talk that people that didn't know 
of her reputation would agree and she'd have playbills printed and posted and make sure she had crowds coming and contact other lecturers to have them come and be there and speak as well. But there were many times that she was the one and only lecturer and she lectured for three to five hours at a time. So of course there was nothing else really going on if she le lectured in the right parts of the time, the season. Um, but mostly people came to see her sometimes by the thousands to see what a woman looked like who would dare stand up and speak. They came to see if she had two heads. Did she wear feminine clothing? What did she look like? And as Judy was saying, the articles would sometimes say, oh, you know, imagine him doing this and it's disgusting and revolting and trying to change the world as we know it and law and society and all of that. And then they'd say, but she was very pleasant looking. <laughs> very pleasant. Although I do believe it was in the orchard in Seneca Falls that she was speaking and her kerchief came, blew, off, blew back in the wind and they wrote up the article, not necessarily what she talked about, but the fact that she didn't have the decency to turn around and tuck her kerchief back in. She just tucked it right back in and kept on talking. And that, that made big news. They, all, they almost always talked about her dress like they do about female politicians now. We don't necessarily talk about their ideas, but we definitely say if they wear pantsuits or not. Um, and also about her hair, her voice, her complexion, and that she was a Quaker. Um, so all of those women she knew, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, as a matter of fact, out here, I have um, a letter <coughs> that she writes to Ala, and you can just see this vague old oval imprint, but this was a letter that she wrote on stationery that Elizabeth Cady Stanton had given her and she writes this letter to Allah on it. Um, so of course she knew, she knew everybody and everybody knew her. She was infamous. Um, at, it, during her time she was, un, and people would say, we need Abby Kelly. And she went to the Midwest and stayed there. There were no newspapers there at the time. And so she started a newspaper. She stayed there 18 months. She was only gonna stay there three months. She stayed there 18 months to start the anti-slavery bugle so the news wouldn't be old news by the time it got to the Midwest. So and she just didn't take no for an answer. And the women of the time didn't take no. They just kept on. How was she funded for all this? This all cost money. Yeah, well, we, yes, it cost money. So what happened was when Abby first started to lecture, she didn't take any money. She had, uh, she would lecture and then people wherever she was, whatever town, she, she was the number one fundraiser for the American Anti-Slavery Society, the number one fundraiser. And I always say, so well we know women, we are fundraisers, right? That's what we do, PTO, PTA, whatever. We're always nonprofits, we're always raising the funds. Um, but sometimes she would find a quarter on, on the table after she lectured, or sometimes she'd find, and she could put up somewhere. Um, again, it was the network, so she usually stayed with people that she knew. So at first she did not take any salary because she wanted all the money to go to um, get agents and everything and the pamphlets printed because they always sold pamphlets to make money. All that money went back to Boston. Every night she'd write letters and how much she got in donations. She always asked for money. She never ended any type of lecture and sometimes she'd go five days in a row but every single time she would ask for money. Um, at times she sold items of her clothing. Um, when her parents died in 1842, it, um, her mom died, Abby was the eldest. She was the seventh of nine children. She was the eldest girl who wasn't married. Um, and so she went back to Millbury, Massachusetts to settle up on the farm. And anything that was left over went to the American uh, um, uh, Anti-Slavery Society. She did ultimately, once they, once Stephen and Abby got married, and Stephen found this farm in Worcester, it's still there, um, private home, uh, in 1845. They got married in 1845. Um, she had Alla, she was pregnant with Alla in 1847. She was out visiting family, and Stephen bought this farm. Well, she writes this letter that's just fantastic. Um, well, Stephen, you found us a home. That's wonderful. I wanted to live in town. We're five miles out. I wanted to have a little vegetable garden. We have 36 acres of rocks. I wanted to have a white picket fence. We have broken down outbuildings. I mean, it went on. And then she said, oh, well, we'll make do. 
So of course, he had dashed all of his dreams. He wanted to be a gentleman farmer. Um, so, but once, she, once they had the farm and they really had to start paying back, they paid $3,600 or something to the farm. Um, she took a salary then, but it was $200 a year. Now, other lectures at the time, there were lots of temperance le lectures. Uh, John Goff, for one, who uh, was in West Boylston, Massachusetts, uh, he'd make $2,000 on his tour for one, one speech. But again, money just, Abby yeah. just wanted the money to go to free humans. So she did take a salary after they bought the farm. Yes? I know it's a generalization, but did the public confusion between a lot of spiritualism with abolitionism, let's say, or women's rights, was do you feel that was productive in any sort of way, or was it not? Well, there, of course, were all, all, there were you know, groups that were just doing seances. I mean, there were spiritualists, and then there were seance, the Fox sisters who went around, and they made it all up. They wrapped so on the table. Right. They're coming down the road. Oh, you know, are they? Oh, my road. gosh, you know the Fox <laughs> sisters. Then. Um, yeah, so they, they were, you know, they, they were quacks. Um, but Abby, actually, one time Stephen is ill, and he, he he writes her a letter and she writes back that she'd actually gone to see a spiritualist who had told her that he's to do X, Y, Z. And so she writes that back, you know, make sure you get this and I'm going to send some medicine for Allah. She's sick and I, this uh, spiritualist, uh, this sayer, I shouldn't say spiritualist, this, this seer said, I ought to send this medicine home to Allah, so I'll do that. I, I don't, I think they were, you know, I think people were definitely at that time period looking, um, and it was a time when people were self-improving. They were looking at what they could do within themselves, what different, um, different social reforms they wanted to be part of. Um, I, I don't think there was much confusion of the people at the time. The original Mormons were seers as well, treasure hunters. Well, I don't know. And who's that again? The who? Joseph Smith. Oh, Joseph Smith. Oh, yes. Oh, when you said Mormon. Oh, my gosh. Well. Wow, what town is that? Palmyra. Well, there you go. There you go. Well, Abby, so Abby was a Quaker, um, but she did not feel that the Quakers, even though they were really the first religious group to realize that slavery was wrong back in the 1700s, but they didn't go out of their, out of their own, they didn't go out into the world. So Abby really felt that by 1840, they were not doing enough. So she came out of her Quaker meeting in Oxbridge, Massachusetts, and that beautiful Quaker building is still there, meeting house, built in 1770. And she writes a letter in 1840, it, you know, I'm, uh, I, I have to leave, not doing enough, I have to leave. Well, of course, even in those days, even though Quakers wanted their um, daughters to be well educated and everything, they still had meetings where the wall came down, they, they had the um, didn't really have ministers. Anyone that felt the light could stand up and speak. Um, I'm telling you about Quakers. You all know about Quakers. Um, some places I go, they, they don't know. Um, but after that, the wall came down, and the men did the business, and the women did, you know, sort of who do we need to counsel, who do we need to talk to, who do we need to sort of thing. And so Abby had written this letter in 1840, and they just ignored it. They didn't address it. So she... <laughs> She sent it in to William Lloyd Garrison into, into Boston. He printed it in the, le in the Liberator. And shortly thereafter, they disowned her. So, but that's, yeah, so it was, was extremely, all, just all of these social reform movements. And Worcester, where uh, Tom and I live now, where Abby lived most of her life, um, was really a hotbed of social reform. Uh, everybody, just like Seneca, I mean, everybody just sort of, they were always looking at different things for self-improvement and, and the betterment of mankind. And actually, it, the first women's rights convention was here in Seneca Falls, 1848. The first national in 1850 was in Worcester, Massachusetts. Uh, Worcester was chosen not only because it was a hotbed of social reform, but it had 27 trains going in and out every single day so people could get there. So they had the first woman, national women's rights convention in 1850. Abby spoke. Lucy Stone spoke, Frederick Douglass was there and he spoke. Elizabeth Cady didn't go, she was pregnant again. Uh, sent a lovely letter and they read that. Um, but that 
first National Women's Rights Convention in 1850 has really, is the beginning of the organized women's rights movement because they set an agenda. They set up committees. They knew what they were going to do. They're going to have annual meetings. They were going to publish proceedings and they were going to have individual groups meet in different places around the United States every year, whereas individual groups on these committees would be doing their work throughout the year. And the, the uh, resolutions that were passed at that 1850 convention, the one that was the most radical was the last one, which was equality before the law without distinction of sex or color. And it was, that's what they said just turned the world upside down, that that idea of putting uh, black people and white people, th women, together was totally radical. And as Judy mentioned, there were lots of articles, and I, I want to uh, read you one description about, if I can find it quickly, about that 1850. So then you can imagine, Abby started to lecture in 1838, early 1839, so 11 years before this, and this is what they were saying about that convention then. Oh, I hope I can find it. Um, but always the most dastardly things. Um, and again, talking about what women wore and calling them the hen, you know, they were, the men that were there were henpecked and the pantaloons. Okay, so this, oh, and this is a New York, this is a New York Herald wrote this. You'll be, you'll be interested in that. October 28th, 1850, the first National Women's Rights Convention. That motley gathering of fanatical mongrels of old grannies, male and female, of fugitive slaves and fugitive lunatics called the Women's Rights Convention, after two days' discussion of the most horrible trash, has put forth its platform and adjourned. The sentiments and doctrines avowed in the social revolution projected involve all the most monstrous and disgusting principles of socialism, abolition, amalgamation, and infidelity. The full consummation of their diabolical projects would reduce society to the most beastly and promiscuous confusion, the most disgusting barbarism that could be devised, and the most revolting familiarities of equalities and licentiousness between white and blacks of both sexes that lunatics and demons could invent. Doctrines like these, contemplating the overthrow of society, law, religion, and decency, might occasion some alarm, but for the notoriously vagabond character of the leaders in the movement, and the fanatical and crazy mongrels and breeches and petticoats who make up the rank and file. Why, there's not a lunatic asylum in the country wherein, if the inmates were called together to sit in convention, they would not exhibit more sense, more reason, more decency and delicacy, and less lunacy and blasphemy and horrible sentiments than this hybrid, mongrel, piebald, crack brain, pitiful, disgusting, and ridiculous assemblage. And there we drop them and may God have mercy on their miserable souls. Amen. <laughs> oh, you gotta love that. So you can imagine what Abby was up against 11 years before that. That New York Herald, is that still around? No. Okay. It really is, right? Okay, but it could be. Could be. Could be the New York Post. I never read that. Okay. Um, yeah, so the courage. Yeah. Sorry. The president pro tem of that convention was J.C. Hathaway from Farmington. I did not know that. With Plenty Sexton from Elmira. Oh. So would you stand up and say that to the back so they can hear you, Judy? Yeah. Um, the president pro tem, the first person, hi, Robin, <laughs> of that women's rights convention was J.C. Hathaway from Farmington. His house is still there, and it has a marker that uh, Preston Pierce got for an underground railroad site. It's a well-documented underground railroad site. And he went with Pliny Sexton from Palmyra, whose house is also still standing in Palmyra. Mm -hmm. So they were, they were part of this group. Mm -hmm. It was be there or be square. <laughs> <laughs> there were a lot of square people. But there were 168 people that signed in as delegates. There were 1,000 people that came at Seneca Falls, there were, that was a local convention, there were 300, 1,000 came to the first national held in Worcester, and the next year, the second national 
3,000 people came. So they came from all over. And the first one drew from 11 different states and several from abroad. They had 167 delegates sign. So what the Herald said was not very successful. Oh, it was a wildly successful. It's just that was the opinion of some people that were not in the know. Yeah, oh no, it was extremely successful. Uh, they continued to have national uh, conventions, uh, except for 1857, and I can't quite remember why that was, up until the Civil War. Uh, uh, 1857, Susan B. Anthony was so upset because all of her compatriots who had helped her organize conventions earlier were pregnant. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't realize that. I knew that was the year, but I didn't realize. That. Oh my goodness! Well, there you go. Um, Including you. No, Abby was 1847, so she oh. was well done. And they only had the one. Oh yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, they only had one child. Abby had um, lectured on the road, obviously, for years. Um, she had uh, all of her teeth out at 46 which is quite interesting. And then, of course, she had to have dentures. And then she was very conscious of speaking with her dentures. And she also had a 35-pound ovarian tumor removed at her home when she was 57 years old. She had actually come to New York to, um, uh, to she sort of exhausted the doctors in the Boston area, came to New York to see a specialist. But Elizabeth Cady Stanton was having a meeting. And so she wanted to go um, hear that. And of course, she stood up and refuted something that Elizabeth Cady Stanton said. Um, but she ultimately went home and had the surgery done right there in the same, in the same house that's still standing. But I mean, all, all of these women, it, you know, you were ill. It didn't matter. You, you know, had Lucy Stone actually had, uh, was it tuberculosis? No. She, she came down with something. Her, her sister-in-law had died of it, and I think she had taken care of her, and I think she had, uh, yeah, uh, she didn't, uh, that sounds very serious. That's, I don't, I don't know, but she was very ill, but still <laughs> traveled to get home, and then still went to the convention, because that's, you know, when she wasn't uh, contagious and all that, but, um, they just continued, regardless of what was written about them. They just handled it, brushed it off, and. Would you talk about Lucy and Stephen's tax resistance? Yes, so um, in uh, 1872, was, they weren't the first. Uh, the sisters in Connecticut were the first. Oh, I don't remember their names. Who, because women couldn't vote, they refused to pay their taxes. They, uh, two sisters that lived together on a farm. They refused to pay the taxes. They were the first. And then Abby and Stephen thought they'd do the same thing because Abby can't vote. She's being taxed, taxed without representation. So they held a tax um, uh, protest. So they planned it in advance and they put it out to their friends and they <laughs> wrote people and wanted people to come to Worcester. And so the very first one was in 1872. Um, it was quite a group that gathered. And um, their neighbor, uh, his last name was Plummer, bought the farm for $100. Well, I guess there were so many neighbors in support of the Fosters that he backtracked and ultimately didn't buy it. And he said, I only did it to show those Fosters they're not above the law. So, um, but then they had several other times. And then uh, Stephen was too ill to, to continue it. And finally, I mean, each year, like, people would come together and help them pay for it. Um, one time, Allah helped them pay for the taxes so they could stay in the house. Um, but then Stephen died in 1881, and Abby sold the farm a couple years after that and moved in with her sister um, in Worcester. Uh, but yeah, the, the, it was a really big deal. It was written up. Obviously, all the newspapers were covering it, you know, that Abby Kelly, she's at it again. Um, but I think, they, I think they actually did that tax protest three, if not four times each year for... Those, those years. But yeah, they, they were just, um, and a actually, so the 15th Amendment, Abby was lecturing with Stephen Douglas. No, no, I just saw his bust in there, that's what made me think of it. Frederick Douglas, about the passage of the 15th Amendment. Now, Lucy Stone had written Abby a letter saying, 
Abby, why is it that you're supporting the 15th Amendment? It doesn't include women. And you must, you must be very ill, or you must be exhausted, or you've had a letdown, and you've got to think straight, and why are you going to be satisfied with half a loaf? And Abby waits a couple weeks, thinking about it, and she writes back to Lucy Stone, and the, um, the, what was being said was since the Civil War, obviously, then the free enslaved people were not worth anything to anybody. So their lives were daily, uh, um, their lives were, were oh, somebody help me out here. They, right, they, they were attacked, and, and so their lives were, were worth nothing. And every day there was, there was uh, the chance that just because of your color, you weren't worth anything now. No one owned you, so you weren't uh, worth anything. So Frederick Douglass and Abby Kelly both felt, as was said at the time, it's a Negro's hour. The 15th Amendment has to pass because if the black man doesn't have the right to vote, nothing is going to change for them. Well, Susan B. Anthony and Elizabeth Cady Stanton did not support the 15th Amendment unless it included uh, suffrage for women. And, uh, but Abby said, but Stephen was in agreement with Elizabeth Cady Stanton, Susan B. Anthony. It has to, it has to be for women and men and black men. It can't just be one or the other. It can, both things can happen at the same time. And Abby said, if this government is, not, is barely willing or not even willing to give the vote to a black man, they're certainly not going to give it to a white woman yet. So when the 15th Amendment passed in 1870, Abby said, there's no worry. Women will get the vote the next year. <laughs> and no, not till 1920. And then it wasn't for all women because Chinese women uh, were not considered citizens, so they didn't get the vote. Native women were not considered citizens, so they didn't get the vote. Um, so yeah, it was, it was quite, a, quite a time. But, all, all, but Abby and Stephen were working in all, on all social reforms. Abby, after the Civil War, went, to the, uh, went fully to the women's rights, but also believing that um, the free people now needed help more than ever, uh, but they voted against her and they closed the anti-slavery societies. Um, she wanted them to stay working now to really help the people that were now freed and had no support system. There were the Freedmen's Bureau um, and that, but again, that was, so ends up being political like everything. So, um, so all, every single reform movement you can think of, they were part of, they were either on the boards or on the committees. As a matter of fact, um, Abby would have been on the women's rights whatever committee, but she had, she had uh, you know, turned too many people off. She was not very popular at that, at that point. She was intolerant. If you were not willing to do the work, she didn't have the time for you. Stand up and you do the work, or I can't be bothered. And that, you know, and that was that. Stand up. Yes. <laughs> Stand up and do the work. Do yes. I want to introduce Robin Noel, who's representing both the 1860 Meeting House and Memorial Amy Zion Church in Rochester, which was Frederick Douglass's church, Hester Jeffrey's church, and a nest of Underground Railroad abolitionists and women's rights activists. Hi, Robin. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you all. Cobblestone Theater, a Quava, which is a group of people with day jobs, totally volunteer actors from Rochester, are doing a presentation called The Women Who Influence Frederick Douglass. Oh, Yay! Boy. Well, we uh, have an Abby? What's happening? Yes, the, we have a list on the back of our handouts today that you can keep and show. And then in September at Wood Library, we're having a panel dedicated to Bishop Edmund Tutu on uh, restorative justice. October 1st, we'll have a panel of a speaker at Ganondagan, which will also be on Zoom, Mary Hauptman, who's probably the most important living historian of Haudenosaunee people. He's going to give a reflection about his 50 years of working and research with Seneca and Haudenosaunee people. 
and that, and that will be at Ganondagan for those who want to participate in, in person and also online. And then on uh, November 12th, we'll have Marissa Corwin Manitowabi, who is going to talk about elementary school kids and museum presentations that can work on teaching Seneca and Haudenosaunee history. All of these, as you can see, Damien Spindler will be, uh, has been videotaping. These will all be available online through the 1816 Farmington Quaker Meeting House Museum with many, many thanks to Humanities New York, for which we are very, very grateful for sponsoring all these. We're so wonderful and so lucky and so happy that you're all here. So come back. Thank you. Thank you.